I only did it for this, for the second applause. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry for all the trouble, but hopefully we are done now, at least with this. So today, um, we want to talk about event-driven networking on Swift and what that even means. I mean, we have all these buzzwords, right? So you may ask yourself, um, why asynchronous event-driven development matters these days and why you should care at all? Well, I think the answer here is quite simple. Because you went to make the best usage out of your resources. Because these days, many times, systems or services run on cloud platforms, for example. Just ask yourself, how many threads do I waste if I'm not doing this? But what have threads to do with asynchronously and event-driven design at all? The key here is to realize that I.O. does not happen as frequently as you may expect. While networks have become faster over the last years and will probably be become even faster over the next years, the reality is that these are still often not saturated. This is especially true if we're talking about um, network traffic which goes on between server and client side like mobile devices. When we talk about I.O. in this context, we are talking about accepting new connections, for example, reading data from the wire, writing data, uh, data to the wire, and many others, right? All of these happen less frequently than you would assume most of the times. The, re the result of this is that we are mostly waiting on an I.O. to happen. How often this is the case highly depend on the protocol you are speaking and on the application pattern itself. In a non-asynchronous blocking model of network programming, you will need to create one thread per connection or reuse one thread that you have created before out of a connection uh, of a thread pool. You may be tempted to say, well, I could just share the one thread between different connections, but this may work for some point in time, but once one of the I.O. operations cannot be completed directly, it will block, which means you can also not make process on the other connection, which may lead to timeouts, for example. So that's not the real solution. In contrast here, with non-blocking I.O., you can see it here in the diagram, you can be, it can be used to handle multiple connections. So it's kind of multiplexing. This is possible because as soon as a connection would block I.O., because of I.O., it signals back for the syscall that it could not be completely done or half done or not done at all. Because of this, your assumption that you may have made before of, well, I call this function or this write, read, or whatever, and it will only return once I have done something real, like getting data, for example, are not true anymore. All of this makes writing code a lot more complex than before. So the question here really is, what justifies all of this complexity that we just introduced because of this concept? To understand why we are happy to accept this kind of complexity, which is a trade-off, as always, it's important to know and realize that these days, if we are talking about high-scaling systems or services, it's not uncommon to have one hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections terminated per box, or even more. So there's a lot of stuff to handle. But what has all of this to do with threads at all, right? Because we talked about threads. Well, to make it short, threads are just not free. They are expensive. Why? Well, because each thread has a memory overhead, which is caused by the stack space it needs to operate. How much this is exactly really depends on multiple things like settings, operation system, uh, operating system, or even like kernel. But even if you ignore like the overhead of memory and you should probably not do that in practice, then there are other things which comes in as limitations. Each time the OS wants to switch to make progress on another thread, it needs to be handled by a scheduler. There are different implementations of schedulers, so how exactly this works 
is out of scope here, but it needs to be done. So every time you want to make progress, you need to context switch. That's not for free. One of the results here, and what may be like the worst, is that you make trash your cache that is sitting on the CPU core. So an operation which would be most of the times very fast is now slow, kind of slow, because you cannot fetch it out of the CPU cache, you fetch it out of L1, L2, or L3 caches, or if you're very unlucky, out of the memory itself. So what can we do about this? Well, I would say non-blocking I.O. to the rescue, which means we are doing asynchronously programming, right? How does we solve this kind of complexity that we just introduced because of asynchronous programs in other languages and environments? Well, on the JVM and any language that runs on the JVM, which would be, for example, Java, Scala, Kotlin, but also others, we are investing in the development of Netty, which helps us to provide an easy-to-use abstraction. In Swift, as today, there's nothing like Netty. There's no thing you can use which just comes out of the box. So with this, well, we said maybe we should create something which is called Swift Neo. And now I will explain to you a little bit what it is exactly, right? So Swift Neo is basically Netty for Swift. The advantages of doing something like this, like porting an existing library from another language, are different, but the most important for us are it has a proven API, which means we saw it with success before. It's very flexible, but still not super complicated, as easy as it can be, basically. Apple has a lot of experience with Netty because we have multiple people that work on Netty or Netty-related projects. Netty enabled many famous large-scale um, projects on the JVM. For example, Apache Cassandra, which is, I think, one of the most well-known NoSQL databases that use Netty. There is Spark, for example, Apache Spark, which is also very popular, I would say, which use Netty. There's GRBC, which is like the RBC library of Google, which used Netty for the Java stuff. And there are many more, uh, many more like Verdex, Finagle, which basically runs the whole Twitter core, and a lot of different projects. It would be too much to tell all of them. It would also be very boring, I guess. So with this in mind, the last really nice factor of this was we thought, well, it would be really easy for people that already have experience with Netty to maybe try to use Swift and not JVM for the service that they are writing. Because the API should be very similar. It's very important to note here that it's a port. It's not a copy. So it's not Java code in Swift. It's Swifty, which I think is very important. So what is Swift Neo? It's basically a low-level networking framework which you can use to build any network application or framework by providing you with a needed abstraction and remove a lot of complexity that you would need to handle by yourself. So you could use it to write, for example, a TCP proxy. Or you could use it to write a DNS server or something like this. It's not limited to one protocol. What is Swift Neo not? Well, it's not a high-level framework, which means it's not the same as, for example, Ketora or Vapor, which provides you with a higher level of abstraction to bootstrap, for example, a web server, right? It's, you can think of it like the layer below. So for example, Ketora or Vapor could use Netty to implement their core I.O. handling which is exactly what other Java frameworks doing with Netty, right? So it's very kind of low level, which means that most normal users probably would not use it directly, but would use a framework which is built on top of it because it's more complex. You can do a lot of stuff. 
So with this, let me give you a quick introduction to Swift Neo. I will only talk a little bit about the core building blocks because otherwise 20 minutes would be way too short. So the core building blocks here is we have an event loop group. An event loop group basically holds multiple event loops. You can think of it a little bit like event loop group is kind of like a thread pool, right? And the event loop is like a thread to do work. And to make it more clear, each event loop is basically tied to one thread, which will never change, which means all the handling of the events are done in the same thread. So basically all the events are done single threaded. Why is this important? I will explain it later. The channel itself is basically the abstraction around an endpoint. What this exactly means depends highly on the implementation and what you do with it, because uh, abstraction should stay the same and not really depend on the underlying implementation. So most likely it's, for example, a file descriptor, a socket. If we're talking about TCP or UDP, right? Then we have the channel pipeline. The channel pipeline is basically assigned to a channel. And the channel pipeline can hold multiple channel handlers. Why is this important? The channel, self, uh, channel handler itself basically allows you to do processing logic. So you can intercept inbound data, outbound data, events, and do something with them, like locking, change the change the format, and this kind of stuff. You can do a lot of cool things with them. And I will show you a few of them. Then we have like different bootstraps, basically. It's more or less a helper to allow you to set up a channel completely. And we will see it as an example later. And then we have our own data container, which we call byte buffer. It's basically a copy on write data structure, which allows you to make more advanced operation on it. So you can read out, for example, an int from it, an unsigned int, and all that kind of stuff. So this kind of things that you usually need if you do network programming. What is really nice is because Swift provides us with copy on write, it's also very cheap to pass from function to function and safe if you have multiple threads. That's really neat. So let us jump into the details of the really important things. An event loop, which we see here in the diagram, does exactly what the name implies. Surprise, it handles events in a loop. That's how it's called, right? In the, in the diagram, we can see that it, returns, uh, it, that it runs in an endless loop, which is not really true because you can also shut it down, but just assume it runs in an endless loop, which makes it easier. And it collects and processes different types of events as an event loop may handle multiple channels because remember, everything is non-plocking. You should never plug. So we want to multiplex on one thread multiple connections. So with this, what we are doing here is to give you like an idea is basically we're waiting for either tasks that are ready to process, which are submitted by the user, or for I.O. I.O. in this context would mean, again, read, accept, write, and all the kind of things. So this method, it's not really implemented like this, but this will actually unplug when there's something to handle. So next, we basically process all I.O., which means we read everything for every channel, we write everything, we accept new connections and all that kind of stuff. And once it's done, we are going through like a queue of tasks that the user submitted that we need to execute. And then we are blocking again until we can continue, right? That's the whole idea here. Now let us go to the interesting parts. So this is the channel pipeline. That's, uh, I think, the most important concept of the whole thing. So the channel pipeline allows you to basically put multiple channel handlers into it and do something with the data. So in this example, we have the back pressure handler. The back pressure handler here, what is this doing? So basically, once you start to write too fast, because everything is non-blocking, right? Your peer may not be able to read everything as fast as you write, especially if there's like mobile devices, bad connections, for example. It will stop reading from a socket, 
which means you push the back pressure on the TCP level of the socket itself. This guards you of high memory usage or even like crashes because of auto memories, right? Then we have like the open SSL handler, which does like encryption, right? And then we have like the echo handler. The echo handler itself just echo bags bytes that it receives. So with all these tri uh, with all these three building blocks, you basically set up a complete echo server. That's it, and it's also encrypted, right? Maybe your requirement change and you don't want encryption anymore. Well, nothing easier. You just remove the SSL handler, and everything else stays the same. To make it easier for you to understand, you actually can think of it like Unix pipes. Each handler is a command in Unix. Then you have a pipe. Then the next one, and the next one, until you hit the end. The only difference here is it's in both directions, right? So how is this done? So let us go into the channel handler itself. The channel handler is not very interesting here. Um, it's basically just have two callbacks, which are called once you add something to the pipeline and once it's removed, right? You can use it to you know, do some inits, whatever, the init kind of stuff, set up the handler. More interesting is the channel inbound handler. The channel inbound handler is basically called once there's some inbound events or data. Um, we will have a look at a few methods of them because otherwise it would be too much. So for example, channel active, this is called once a channel becomes active. What that means depends on the implementation again. For a socket, it would be once, an uh, once a connection is established, right? The same is for inactive, once the connection is closed, it's called. Then um, we have channel read, which is called once there's data which was read and dispatched. We can do like data manipulations. Channel read complete, which is called once there's no more data to read until we need to block again, right? So it marks like I'm done with it now until I unblock again. And then error caught, which is called once there's an inbound error happening. So you can do something there. Most of the times you just want to close the channel because there's no recovery. The channel outbound handler is basically the same just in the outbound direction. Outbound is basically everything that you trigger as a user. So for example, we have um, write, which writes some data to the channel. The interesting thing is we buffer it, and it's only really written to the socket once we call flush. We do that for optimization so we can save syscalls, which make it faster, right? Um, the important thing here is you have a promise which is passed in. The promise is basically like a placeholder which is notified once operation completes, because everything is non-blocking, remember. So here's an example that we used before in the pipeline. Um, it's the echo handler, it's super easy, so I will just go through it very quickly. Um, channel read is called, then we call write, so we bounce back the data to the remote peer, right? We are not interested in the result, so we just pa uh, pass in nil as a promise. Um, channel read complete is called, which means there's no more data to read. Then we call flush, which means we flush all the previous written buffer data with one syscall, hopefully, if we can. And then there's error called when we just close the connection, right? It's done. We cannot recover. So how you would marry everything of this together? So we have this bootstraps, right? So here we're bootstrapping the echo server, basically. Um, it's pretty simple. You build up the event loop group, which means like this are the amount of threads that you're using. Um, then you can set some configurations which are done on the accepted channels, which are the child options. Then the child handler, where you set up your pipeline, what handlers you want to stick in there, right? For processing logic. Then you call bind, which means like, hey, now I want to bind the socket. And then you call wait, which blocks until it's done. That's only safe here because we are not in the event loop, because you should not block the event loop, right? The interesting thing here is that you can modify the pipeline on the fly, which means you can do a lot of interesting things. You can do connection upgrades, by uh, protocol upgrades, by basically remove handlers, replacing them or even like detect which protocol you're speaking in at the right thing, right? So it's very flexible. So what does Swift Neo mean for the Swift ecosystem here? Well, we think we can have the same impact with this kind of stuff as we do with Netty in the JVM world, which means we want to make it easy for the users of Swift to build server-side applications, but also client, we support also client non-blocking, high-scale applications. We want to help to influence the language to provide 
the user with the features to do something like this. We did the same in Java with Netty, right? And in fact, we already influenced the Swift compiler team to do an optimization because we saw, hey, there was one arc happening which we didn't expect. So we wrote a patch to the compiler and everyone got it for free. That's the idea. But I think with all the contracts, I have something really exciting to share today because as of today, we open source this kind of stuff. So it's on GitHub. You can just grab it there. You can check out the code. You can use it directly. Um, we hope you're really excited about this, and we hope we can help with this to bring like the server-side Swift community to the next level. We love pull requests. If you find any issues, have comments, feel free to reach out. Don't be shy. It's an open source thing. So I hope you're excited as we are of this. Thanks again. <laughs>